admit it. When the headlines, cable TV, and the blogosphere scream about a bad mother, famous or not, we can't seem to get enough. And the ones who are most intent on sucking the marrow out of these kinds of stories are mothers. We just can't keep our minds off individuals like Andrea Gates, who in the throes of postpartum depression drowned her children in the bathtub. Or Susan Smith, who drove hers into a lake, allegedly because the man she was dating didn't like kids. What's our fascination with the bad mother? Aren't we secretly gloating underneath our horror? Do their reprehensible acts make us feel better about the kind of mothers we are? Maybe the truth is that we are so insecure about our inability to measure up to the mythic good mother that we readily point to the worst mother model around us just to give ourselves one of those little, at least I'm not that bad, ego boosts. And if we truly are that uncertain about the job we're doing, how did we get that way? And more to the point, How can we lighten up and stop calling out the bad mother police on ourselves and other women every time a kid has a meltdown in the supermarket? I'm Annie Fox, and this is Family Confidential, Secrets of Successful Parenting. Today's show, Am I Really a Bad Mother?, or is the bar unrealistically high? My guest today is Ayelet Waldman, author of the New York Times bestseller, Bad Mother, a chronicle of maternal crimes, minor calamities, and occasional moments of grace. Her other books include Love and Other Impossible Pursuits, Daughter's Keeper, and The Mommy Track Mysteries. Her personal essays have been published in a wide variety of newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, Vogue, and Parenting. Her radio commentaries have appeared on NPR's All Things Considered. And the film version of Love and Other Impossible Pursuits with Natalie Portman in the lead role premiered at the Toronto Film Festival in September 2009. Back in March 2005, Ayelet Waldman wrote an essay for the New York Times in which she said, and I quote, If a good mother is one who loves her child more than anyone else in the world, I am not a good mother. I am, in fact, a bad mother. I love my husband more than I love my children. Today we're going to talk with Ayelet Waldman about that breakthrough essay, the immediate firestorm it triggered, and where we American mothers seem to be today. Welcome, Ayelet, and thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Annie. Oh, my pleasure. Um, your book, Bad Mother, is a magnetic title. It's like a built-in draw for women, especially mothers in particular. We, we just eat this stuff up. And why is that? Well, I'll tell you, standing and, uh, you know, sitting and signing books at bookstores, there is not a woman who does not hand me her book and say, did you write it about me? <laughs> I mean, that's sort of the, the constant refrain, which is because we all have that little voice in our heads that tells us we're, that we're doing a terrible job, that we're bad mothers, that we're failing our children, that, you know, we didn't pack an appropriately high, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil free snack, or we didn't, you know, we yelled or whatever it is that we do, these minor failings that begin that in our imagination assume these great proportions and, uh, you know, we fear will damage our children or at the very least give them an excuse to spend $150 a week in therapy for the rest of their lives. uh, Essentially, my book is really a feminist diatribe. Oh, I definitely got that. (laughs) And I I really admire you for it because you say things that, well, obviously the women who you're talking to on these book tours, you speak to them. And these are not things that have been said out loud very much. I'd love to Go back to the essay that you wrote for the New York Times back in March in 2005, um, in which you said, and I quote, if a good mother is one who loves her child more than anyone else in the world, I am not a good mother. I am, in fact, a bad mother. I love my husband more than I love my children. Tell us about the response you got from that piece. Oh, you know, there was this incredible outpouring of drama. Did that surprise you? I didn't really think about it so much. I mean, in retrospect, I suppose the extent of it surprised me. I'm not surprised that people disagree with me, but I guess I was surprised at just how crazy 
uh, it became and how ubiquitous it became, you know, the, it was everywhere. It was on the view when I was on Oprah and it was in every newspaper and every radio show and I, you know, over and over and over again, you know, and it was all over the world. I was, you know, I was getting calls to do radio interviews from you know, all over the world. I, I guess it, what surprised me is the, the intense emotional reaction that a lot of women had. Mm-hmm. You know, when I read something that I disagree with, I might say, Oh, that writer's an idiot or, or what a moron. But I, it, I rarely have ever had the experience of taking someone else's words and having them, taking them so profoundly personally. And I think that this piece, for some reason, was taken incredibly personally by a lot of women. I think I, I was talking to my friend Lisa Belkin, who's a writer for the New York Times Magazine, who writes mostly about women's issues. And I was asking her why she thought it was that she, her pieces and the stuff that I write tend to get such visceral reactions. And she said she felt like when you write about women of our generation, women in their 30s and 40s, you are not so much writing an essay as you are writing a Rorschach blot. And everybody, you know, they see what they want to see and they see their own lives and they see their own personal experience reflected in the piece more than they, you know, really see what it is that you're trying to say. And I guess that's, you know, that's a good thing. I mean, as a writer, you want to, you want a response. Well, I love getting the email. I'm, I don't love getting the hate mail, yeah. but I'm actually really good at that at this point. I think I, I'm, I can always tell within three words, whether it's hate mail or not. And I just delete it. Although I have to say, you know, I feel like that essay started a real conversation because at this point, four years later, when I published this book, I got almost no hate mail and I got almost no negative responses. And the vast majority of the responses I got were incredibly, incredibly positive. And, you know, it was the sort of amen sister. And I think it's because there's been a slight transition in, you know, how women think about themselves and think about parenting. And there's been a little bit of a backlash against that, you know, compulsive, crazy, good parenting Mm -hmm. that I was responding to when I wrote that first essay. And I I know I I like to think that I was part of that, of inspiring that backlash. And I'm definitely proud of it. Yeah, well, it it certainly sounds like there has been a re-education or at least a shift in some more positive direction. Yeah, the beginnings of one. A slight, you know, let's not get overexcited, but yeah. (laughs) Right. It takes a while. I mean, really, we've been hammered in with the idea of how important it is to be a good mother for so many eons here. You know, we can't expect an overnight shift here. And correspondingly, the significance of the bad mother, you know, I mean, we've had that image for her too, Medea and company. Yes, Medea. And so thinking about it, personally, as I'm reading your book, I'm thinking, well, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as the person who drives her kids into the lake. I'm not as bad as the person who drowns her kids in the bathtub. But why are we, we as a group of a generation of of women, multi-generations of women, mothers ourselves, so eager to be the bad mother police? Well, I think it's for that very reason, because just what you were saying, I'm not as bad as Andrea Yates. I'm not as bad as Susan Smith. I mean, I think it makes us we're so insecure that we need to identify these paragons of evil. You know, we need to identify the mothers who make us feel better about ourselves. So as, as crappy as you feel about yourself at any given moment, at least you're not as bad as Britney Spears. You know, you manage to wear panties and put your kid in a car seat. And are we so insecure because the ideal of being the good mother is so unrealistic? I think so. I think I think the insecurity stems from, I think it's sort of more complicated than that. I think we've developed this incredibly unrealistic idea of the good mother because of our insecurity. I mean, I, you know, it's sort of a chicken and the egg problem. But I think a lot of this, I mean, the problems of our current generation, you know, sort of women who are raised by, if not by feminist mothers necessarily, but then by mothers who at least had, had some consciousness of the women's movement and were raising, there are very few women who were raised by their mothers, you know, outside of like, you know, compounds in Utah who were raised by their mothers to have a lot of children and, uh, you know, devote themselves to their husbands. You know, the vast majority of women my age and younger were raised with the notion that they could be anything they wanted. They could be president, they could be a doctor, they could be a lawyer, they, they, you know, their, their horizons were unlimited. And what ended up happening was that our mothers changed at us. They changed us, they changed our aspirations, they changed our goals. But the world didn't change quite as fast as we did. So by the time we got out into the workplace, it suddenly, it was a rude awakening to realize, oh, you know what, being, you know, partner at a law firm and an actual 
participant in my child's lives is incredibly challenging. Or if I uh, participating in my kids' lives when I have to hold down two jobs because I have to pay health insurance is incredibly challenging. So um, that confronting of the real world and that sense of crushed expectations. Um, I don't know a woman who has not made some kind of professional sacrifice in order to be a mother. I mean, some of them leave their jobs entirely. Some of them just shift to different, you know, mommy track way positions. So, and some of them just, you know, pull themselves in a million different directions. But those sacrifices, once we've made them, we start to feel like, well, they better be worth it. You know, that our, we, they, we better be really good at this motherhood thing or else why did we... Why did we sacrifice everything we wanted to be our whole lives? Our children better be successful and above average and all those things that we expect of them nowadays. Otherwise, was the sacrifice worth it? I mean, what have we done? So I, I think that's the bind that we're in now. And I think that as the world begins to catch up to the changing role of women, that things will get easier. And I also think as men begin to catch up to sort of changed expectations, things will be easier. It seems to me that there are so many women, especially here in the Bay Area, who focus so intensely and intently on their children as their sole project. That, right. That, that w- They've channeled all that ambition all that of they once brought to being, you know, the CFO of an internet company into managing the nursery school pro, you know, committee and all that crap. That's true. It is crazy. And I see it all the time. I do a lot of parent education and and. None of us can hope to live up to that kind of 150% effort that some of these women focus on. And I'm sure they themselves probably don't believe they're doing as much as they could be doing. But for the rest of us peons, the woman who has the, the perfectly decorated cupcakes that she brings in, and she always looks great in her little tennis outfit, and her children are dressed beautifully, and all that stuff, the rest of us look like a bunch of slobs. And I can certainly identify with the lowering of self-esteem when we start thinking, well, she's a much better mother than I am, for whatever reason. And it may be totally misplaced, but we feel it. And it's very sad, and it's certainly not helping us nor our children. If you spend any time at all in the playground and hanging out with the other moms, I don't think you come away with the sense that everybody is really, really happy. Like there's this generalized euphoria. No, I think there's this kind of low grade depression that you see all around you. I mean, that's why Oprah had me on her show way back when, when I published that piece, not because it was such a crazy controversial thing to say, but because she had diagnosed what she called a kind of slow burn in her audience with all these stay at home moms. And this incredible dissatisfaction with their lives and a a feeling of being completely unfulfilled, that feeling, that depression was just kind of ubiquitous. And she had me on essentially because she thought what I had talked about in that one notorious essay from which I will never be able to escape my entire life, that 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 was part of the problem that she had diagnosed. But how interesting I yell it because it sounds like there was a lynch mob that was that was unleashed when you first oh, No, it was good TV, right? So like um I knew that Oprah agreed with me, but they assembled 24 women, 20 of whom were, you know, ready to string me up. It was good TV. First you had these women screaming about what a horrible mother I was and what a horrible person and showing, you know, interview after interview with what great mothers they were and, you know, how their children. There's one woman who, like, she had a balance beam in her house and she, her kids played the harpsichord and they, <laughs> her whole life was spent driving them from place to place. And, you know, the ultimate irony is that woman emailed me after the show and said, I am so profoundly miserable. Please help me. Please tell me how not to be so unhappy. And um, confessed all these things about her lives, a life that, of course, they had never bothered to photograph. So my email back to her was, you know, step one, get rid of the harpsichord. Let's ratchet the overachieving back a little bit. And let's see if we can't, if, if by doing that, you can't achieve some kind of more rational notion of what it means to be a parent. Interesting. So the depression and what Oprah had very accurately pinpointed was not something that at least initially these women were willing to cop to. I think that it's also a really interesting point, and one of the chapters in your book spells it out in kind of a a revolutionary way, that this slow burn that you're talking about translates into a lack of intimacy between husbands and wives. And I, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to talk yes. about that a little bit because you certainly, you don't want to, you don't want to make love with someone you're pissed at. 
Right, exactly. I mean, the whole reason I wrote the piece, the way I, the way into that piece was I was trying to figure out why I was still having sex with my husband and nobody else I knew was. And in fact, the authors of the anthology where the piece originally appeared, they when they came to me and they said, okay, I yell it, we've got people writing about, um, you know, it was a book about mothers. We've got people writing about having cancer. We've got people writing about divorce. And we've got people writing about, you know, having sons. And we've got people writing about this and that. And the other thing, we've got nobody writing about sex. And since you're, you're the only person we know is having any, it's got to be you. <laughs> Right. So that's what I was responding to. And it is amazing. I mean, I think there is this this kind of bed death, ubiquitous bed death. I mean, everyone knows couples who are still doing it, but I think most are doing it a lot less than they want. And I think the reason they're doing it so infrequently is because the women are pissed off. I mean, they're they're sick and tired of assuming more of the burden of the home and children than they expected to. I mean, most women imagined a more egalitarian division of labor than labor than is actually going on in their houses. And they're tired and they're overextended and they're drained and they're depressed and nobody wants to have sex when you're feeling any of those things. So I had this whole chapter where I basically saying all these men who are writing me saying, you know, how can I make my wife more like you, which basically translates to how can I get laid? You know, um, instead of giving her flowers and sexy underwear, which is really only a present for you, sir. Why don't you unload the dishwasher? Why don't you do all the shopping for the birthday parties for, you know, the next six months? I mean, do all those things that women sort of unconsciously assume is their role. And, um, and if by alleviating the burden on your wife, you make her happy, then I'm willing to bet that you're going to get laid more often. So true. And because we think we need to do it all to be a good mother, we're not going to tell our husbands that we're disappointed and or resentful that they're not picking up the slack. So we'll right, just... Well, one of the things we feel most guilty about is that that is mm-hmm. our own... Mm-hmm. I mean, the things that makes us feel like the worst mothers is our feeling of disappointment and our feeling of frustration. Because what kind of a mother doesn't take pleasure in every moment that she's with her child? Interesting. What kind of a mother does X, Y, and Z? And if I'm doing X, Y, and Z, what kind of a mother am I? I'm not a good one. Right, and right. exactly. This internalization, I think it's damaging to women's self-esteem, but what does it do to the children who are being raised by these really unhappy, unfulfilled mothers? I think about that a lot. Like, what, what does it do to a kid to be raised feeling like his mother's happiness depends on his success, mm-hmm. right? That his, mother, that his mother's entire identity rests in her role in relation to him. I mean, it's a huge burden on those narrow little shoulders. It's not fair. Like, you know, all these kids who, are, who we spend so much time worrying about their self-esteem, it's sort of a related issue, who grow up thinking, you know, the sun shines out of their ass. I mean, what kind of, what kind of adults are they going to be? What kind of community members? Are they going to approach people with empathy and consideration for their feelings? Or are they mostly going to be thinking about their own needs and their own self-esteem? Well, I'll tell you, I write a lot about stress in kids, and, and I get email from teens from all over the world and have been for 12 years now. And a lot of what comes to me from these kids, who I can only assume are being raised, at least in part, by moms who are experiencing some of this dissatisfaction and disappointment and self-loathing that you're describing so accurately, is that the kids do, in fact, feel a lot of pressure to perform to a certain level for their moms. You know, kids will say to me, I've got this going on, so much pressure, the AP classes, I I feel like my head is splitting with this packed after school schedule. And my parents feel like my life is perfect, which I translate into saying my parents need to feel like my life is perfect. So I can't go to them with any of this. That's so interesting. It's it's (laughs) really sad. So it's cyclical, you know, it's the, the mom's unwillingness to take a, a real look at what's going on here and what can be changed, what can be shifted inside the family dynamics so that everybody's happier right? <laughs> um, exactly. would, would ripple out in real positive ways. You know, it's so interesting. I was just thinking about this the other day. I'm sort of mo- morally opposed to after school activities. I, I just, I find this whole sports culture just despicable. I, you know, maybe I, I get it, you know, if your kid loves a sport, fine, but it, that doesn't ever seem to be what it's really about. It's all about like, you know, getting on the good soccer team and getting on the touring ball team or whatever it is. We enrolled our the older kids each in soccer for a season or two. And when they didn't like it, we were very happy to take them out. We enrolled our son in baseball for a season. When we didn't like it. We were very happy to take him out. So we don't, the way I work it is if you really want to do something, you make the case to me 
And if you really want to do it and you're willing to, you know, spend the time on it, fine. I'll organize that activity for you. But otherwise, forget it. Nothing. You know, it, it's never, it never comes from me. Because what I want to do and what my husband wants to do is in the afternoons, once we get the misery of homework, the unnecessary misery of homework out of the way, we just want to be together as a family. And I was, so my daughter's starting high school and um, she's got lots of interests, things that she pursues, but she's, she is, has had, because we have made it so, a very empty schedule her whole life. And, um, and I was thinking about like her college applications and what, you know, it's like her extracurricular activities. It's just going to be like hanging out with my parents. <laughs> and uh, you know what? The one comfort I have is that in my, in my house, there's one person who went to Harvard and one person who went to Pitt. And guess which one won the Pulitzer Prize? So even if my kids, even if the fact that I've refused on principle to involve my kids in any activity that they weren't, that wasn't coming from them and their own, that they didn't seek it out themselves, even if that means that they are doomed to a lifetime of fourth tier colleges, at least then they're more likely to, you know, they're, they're just as likely to end up having lives of professional satisfaction than if they are like me and do everything they're supposed to do and go to Harvard. Hey, man, I'm just thinking that those admissions people who are reviewing those incoming applications, when they see one from your daughter who honestly says, okay, here's my after school resume. I really dug hanging out with my parents. I did it for years. That'll just jump out of the pile. Exactly. <laughs> That'll be a good thing. But since we've repeated refused to pay $40,000 for her to have a college tutor and since we refused to pay $10,000 for her to have SAT prep, um, you know, they'll be like, oh, wow, what's going on with that? She doesn't, you know, I just, that whole thing has gotten so, it's just so, it's so crazy. It's crazy. And, you know, the parents are always saying, wish we had more time together as a family. Right. Well, hello, why don't you guys create a priority here as a family and say, you know, once a week, you want to do an after school activity, that's great. You choose it, you get into it, and you take responsibility and initiative for it. But this four and five days a week plus weekends schlepping all over the place for these practices and games, and then apparently not enjoying it. Right. Wh who is it for? It's so ridiculous. And I think about it, I was talking to a friend of mine who has a bunch of sons, I wouldn't say how many because that'll identify her too clearly. And okay, a um, bunch. <laughs> a bunch of sons. And she was saying, we we're talking about this whole, you know, having dinner with your family. And I never, I could just never understand, like, who doesn't have dinner with that? How is that, like, a thing you have to do? Like, it's dinner time. You, ever, you sit down and eat. What, like, what is such a big deal about that? And she said, oh, you know, it's just, it never happens. And it's always catch as catch can. You just make your own dinner because everybody has practice and everybody has this, that, and the other thing. We can never sit down as a family because everybody's on different schedules. And I just thought, really? Really? Because is your kid going to be a professional soccer player? Because if not, then why the hell is he going to practice five days a week? Like, what is it because he is personally fulfilled by this amount of soccer practice? I mean, does it have anything to do with anything other than getting into college? Because if it doesn't, what is your problem, you know? Is it really going to, is the fact that your kid goes to, I don't know, Bowdoin instead of Yale really going to make a difference in terms of, their experience of life or is the fact that they never had dinner once with their family. Maybe that's going to make a difference in terms of their experience of their lives. And what was her response? Uh, I was not quite so adamant and dogmatic. I just sort of <laughs> wondered at it. Mm. I think what she feels is sorry for my kids who are never going to get into Harvard. Oh, poo. You know? Well, here's the thing that I'm thinking about. It's like, what are you practicing for? Are, well, you, practicing exactly. to, are you practicing to be a loving partner? Um, are you practicing to be a good parent? Are you practicing to listen with respect and an open heart to the people who are around the table with you and share ideas and dreams and fears with people that you feel safe with? Or are you practicing to be a goalie? I, I right. don't really get it. It's so funny. I remember on my college application, I really, you know, I was a member of some clubs and schools, sort of the way we were back in the early 80s, you know, very kind of casually. You didn't have to, you didn't have to, you know, solve the Mideast peace crisis in 11th grade, you could be a member of the current events club or whatever. But anyways, I was a member of some clubs, but I, I didn't, I worked. I always had a job because I, you know, was part of, I had to, my family didn't have that much money. So I worked 20 hours a week and I read novels. So when it came to extracurriculars, really all I did was read. I mean, I read hours and hours a day on weekends. I woke up in the morning. I read until it was time to go to sleep. And I would sometimes go to the movies, but you know, that was my life. And could you imagine right now, like some kid who said, who wrote on their college application, well, this is what I did with myself 
for my entire childhood. I love to read and I basically read. But isn't that exactly the person who you want to hang out with that is an adult? The person who remembers all the books they read as a child and has this incredible love of literature? Yes. I mean, is that the person you want in your English class if you're an English professor? I would think so. Absolutely. Okay, I'd like to shift gears here for a minute if I might. In the book, you talk with great candor about your most difficult decision that you had to make as a mother to have an abortion when amniocentesis revealed that your baby had a rare chromosomal defect, which could lead to mental retardation or other unknown abnormalities. So let's kind of segue into a really difficult kind of conversation, which is happening on a national level, but as well as very personally, I'm sure, within families, the abortion debate. Can can you share us a, a little bit about your current feelings coming out of that decision that was so difficult for you and Michael to make, how did it shift your perspective of the abortion debate? Well, it was a very traumatic decision for us. I mean, it really it was really sort of emotionally devastating in many ways. But I, I am absolutely of the belief that for us, we did the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, there is no doubt in my mind that we made the right decision for ourselves and for our family. Um, which is not to say that I don't feel guilty and ashamed and tormented by the decision, but I, I also know that I would feel much more that, that the negative feelings that I have now would be magnified to a much more significant degree if, um, if I had gone through with the pregnancy and had the child mm -hmm. or could have been. But I do think that as the, that the women's movement needs to confront that complexity of emotion when we talk about abortion, that in, you know, the age of the four dimensional ultrasound, it's really important to acknowledge a, the emotion the possible emotional fallout from an abortion and, and the complexity and difficulty of the decision itself. And also to not allow ourselves to, to engage in, in sort of comfortable, but false rhetoric about what it is, you know, we're doing. I remember at one point my mother said, you know, in, in try and trying to, to make me feel better because she was so sad that I was so distraught. She said something like, you know, well, fetus is not really a baby. It's just a clump of cells. And I'm like, well, you know, with the, who sucks his thumb and has fingernails and toy. I mean, it was like, it was just such a, it was such a meaningless thing to say when I had seen the ultrasound picture and I had watched my baby sucking his thumb on the ultrasound. But so I feel really profoundly that we need to have real honesty in the debate. On the other hand, I, I think we should have real honesty in the debate. So, um, for example, women who have these kinds of genetic terminations need to call them abortions. You know, I mean, there's, there's this kind of a false language on, in, the, in the support community. You know, there's one, one website that calls it a heartbreaking choice, my AHC, they say, rather than my abortion. And I think that what all that does is say is put the right to have to make that decision in peril. Hmm. One thing that I found incredibly frustrating was that in my support group, there were Catholic women who had, who had always been pro-life, who had received dispensation from their priest to get this abortion, who were still pro-life. Just, you know, their situation was different, right? And that I find really frustrating. There's a reason that there are very, very few babies with Down syndrome born to women over the age of 35 nowadays in America. And that's not because women have, our chromosomes have suddenly improved to such a dramatic degree for, because, you know, women are not having, are getting pregnant earlier. It's because the, I think it's probably the majority, although I don't have these figures for it, but women who find out that they're pregnant with a baby with Down syndrome terminate. And this is what people are doing, and to try to pretend it's not happening is ludicrous. And, you know, Sarah Palin can get on TV all she wants and say, we need more babies like Trig in the world and not fewer. And somehow that's like a wonderful, legitimate thing to say. But when I get on TV or the radio and say, you know, I decided, like the vast majority of women, that I was not willing to have a mentally retarded baby – then I, you know, I have to be ashamed of that. And I have to, uh, that has, that's like, she's the good mother because she had the baby who's mentally retarded. And I'm the bad mother because I killed the baby who is mentally retarded. I mean, it's a very, it's traumatizing in a way, but at the same time, it's also such an aggressively dishonest debate because everybody tries to pretend that the world is full of Sarah Palin's when the truth is almost everybody makes the decision I made. Where do you see this going in our country on a societal level? Oh, God, I wish I knew. 
I have no idea. Ultimately, wh- what do you think is the most just outcome of all this? I mean, I actually feel okay about certain limitations on abortion that I know that women, other women who are as, are as ardently pro-choice as I am would not agree to. So for example, I think that it is perfectly legitimate to say that if a woman is pregnant past 24 weeks with a healthy fetus and her life is not in danger, her health is not in danger, that it's okay. That I think it's okay to, to preclude abortion under those circumstances. Um, and I know that's kind of sacrilege among to some women who are pro-choice. But I actually think it's okay to say if the mother's health is not in danger and the baby is healthy and it's past the point of viability, which is essentially, you know, Roe versus Wade. That's what Roe versus Wade says. I think it's okay to say mm-hmm. you, to preclude abortion under those circumstances. I think when there's damage to the fetus, that the, the decision whether or not to terminate was to reside exclusively in the woman. I don't think it should reside in the woman and her doctors because that's this bogus paternalistic nonsense like, oh, you can't make the decision alone. You have to make it with your wise physician. Mm-hmm. No, I think it should be entirely up to the woman. And I think when the woman's health is in danger, the same thing is true. You know, when things get trickier, it's stuff like emotional health. And then we have to make a call, you know, what it what that means, you know, and, and that's where the law gets more complicated. Before that, I would say that there should be an absolute right to abortion. What I really think is going to happen in this country, I think there's going to be effectively a, a system similar to that or more liberal in certain states. If you live in California, if you live in New Jersey, if you live in New York, basically if you live on the coasts, you're going to be able to pursue your right. And if you live in the middle, you're going to get on a plane if you can afford it. (laughs) And if you can't afford it, you're screwed. I have this kind of brutal attitude towards it, which is, you know what? You're going to ban gay marriage. You're going to take away women's rights to choose. Okay, fine. Live in that state of misery. And what I was going to end up happening is all the wonderful, fabulous gay people and feminists are going to leave your miserable state of Mississippi and they're going to move to California where they're welcome and we'll all be happy and you can be miserable by yourselves. Shooting one another with your M16s that you, that everybody's allowed to bring to church. When I'm at my most... And my darkest, Mm -hmm. that's where I go. Yeah. But I think in all seriousness, what will happen is that it will be uh, women who have money and women who live on the coasts will have a right to abortion. And women who don't have money will be ground under the heel of the paternalistic boot of the likes of Newt Gingrich. Mm. And that's just really sad. But you know what? There's only so many battles you can fight. True. True. And and the battle that your book focuses on mostly is how to liberate women from this oppressively self-defeating view that they're not good enough as mothers. And I'd love to have you respond to your own words here, but I'm going to quote you again, because I think it really does sum it up. Your job is not to be the parent you always imagined you'd be the parent you always wished you'd had. Your job is to be the parent your child needs, given the particulars of his or her own life and nature. Well said, Ayala. Can you tell me your job there as a parent to get what your kid needs? What is the biggest barrier as you see it for parents to actually see what their kids need? Well, I guess it's twofold. I think, number one, people become distracted by what their kids want mm-hmm. right so they and my, my husband had this funny line that he just gave an interviewer who asked him you know something along that very question you know how would your kids feel about it was sort of the thing about you know prioritizing your marriage isn't that devastating for your children and is what would your what would your kids want you to to do as a father and my husband well, what my kids want me to do is give them an unlimited supply of candy but that's why i don't turn to my children for you know romantic and and parenting (laughs) advice. So um, that's one thing that gets in the way. And then I think also what gets in the way is all of our expectations of what we should do and what, what it means, this kind of uh, external notion of what a good mother should be and should feel. And we we sort of lose sight of what our kid actually needs from us. And, and, you know, the kid kids needs aren't usually that complicated, you know, they need to be fed and sheltered and loved and to have limits drawn and to be taught how to take responsibility for themselves. And I mean, one of the things about parenting that I, that I think is so hard is that if you do it well, if you love your children, you're setting yourself up for an unrequited passion. 
Because if you do your job right, then your kids grow up and they leave you behind and they create a life with someone else and create a family with someone else. And that becomes their priority. So even the best possible outcome is the outcome that leaves you sitting by the phone, leaving, you know, ever more plaintive voicemail messages. Darling, call your mother, you know. (laughs) So it is kind of a sad, it's, it's, you know, there's just sort of a bittersweet quality to it. Wow. I think you have just really identified part of the reason why moms especially are unwilling to give up their need to be needed in that way. Mm-hmm. I see it all the time at these parent ed events where the parents are complaining about how dependent there are 13, 14 year old kids or he needs me to wake him up in the morning. Otherwise he can't get to school on time. He needs me to do this, this, and this. And they say that their goal is for their kid to become more independent. And yet, and yet. And yet the kids aren't allowed to like go to the corner to the candy store by themselves. I mean, everyone wants independent children, but yet they police every moment of their existence. There's that. And they also cater to them. Right. They continue to cater to them by setting the alarm, by waking the kid up, by laying his clothes out, by making his lunch, by escorting him out the door, by driving him, by delivering him into his homeroom, all of that stuff so that they continue to need to be needed. And it's so funny. My daughter is going to high school next year. So Sophie starts ninth grade and we live in Berkeley and she's going to go to Lick Wilmerding, which is in the city. Uh So um, the decision that I, I felt like in her deciding where she went to high school, my decision was whether or not she went to public school. Like that was the decision I got to make because frankly, she wasn't going to be paying that tuition bill herself. So my husband and I, we were the ones who decided whether we were willing to pay for private school. But once that decision was made, the school, which particular school she wanted to go to, that was her own choice. So she chose the school. She was desperate to go there. It was the only school she wanted to go to. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. And I said to her, well, here's the thing. So you have to take responsibility for your own commute. So you have to do this one morning. Get up at the same at the time that you would be getting up and see if you can hack it. Mm-hmm. So she did it. She said, no problem. And then I said to her, I was telling people about it. And I said to these people, well, I said to her, you know, I'm not driving you to BART in the morning. I don't wake up at six o'clock. So, and you have to be on a seven o'clock BART train. I get up at eight, baby. So you're going to have to figure out how to get yourself to BART. It's like three quarters of a mile from the house. You can take the bus. You can get a ride with friends. You can walk, whatever you're going to do. And people looked at me like I was insane. A like this was some mother. horrible, <laughs> right? That I wasn't willing to wake up an hour early and drive her to BART. And, and for a while I started feeling like, what kind of a mother am I that I prioritize my sleep over her, you know, ride. And then I thought, you know what, this is what it means to take responsibility for your decision. Yeah. You want to go to this school. The school is an hour away. You know, go with God, my child. If you can get yourself to school, you can do it. And if you can't, then there are lots of great schools in the East Bay where you can go to. But on the other hand, I know everyone else, I mean, maybe one of the reasons I get to do this is because there's so many quote unquote good mothers out there who are driving their children to BART so they can pick up my daughter and I can <laughs> loll about in bed until eight o'clock. But I do feel like it's the same reaction that we, my husband and I get when we tell people that we let our kids take the bus to downtown Berkeley and go to the movies or we let them walk around by themselves or, you know, starting at this age, my, my youngest daughter is eight. And so at eight years old in our family, you're allowed to go around the corner to Star Grocery and, and sign for your ice cream cone and have an ice cream cone and sit and watch the people go by and, and bring yourself home. And as far as I know, my kids are the only kids, eight-year-olds, who get to do that in this incredibly safe, wonderful neighborhood that we live in. Everybody else would you know rather die than let their, their children have that kind of independence because they're convinced that they'll be snatched by sexual predators at any moment. And um, it's sad, but it's true. Yeah, we, it's a very fearful world that we live in. Much of it is the fear in our minds. And what ends up happening is the kids are not given an opportunity to grow up. Right, and then we're surprised when they're immature right. and dependent. Failure to launch. Right. <laughs> Um, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us. Um, the book is called Bad Mother, A Chronicle of Maternal Crimes, Minor Calamities, and Occasional Moments of Grace. My guest has been Ayelet Waldman. Thank you very much, Ayelet. Thanks so much, Annie. It was a pleasure. You can learn more about Ayelet Waldman's books and essays at ayeletwaldman.com. I'm Annie Fox for Family Confidential. 
For more information about my work with tweens, teens, and parents, visit AnnieFox.com. And tune in next time when my guest, Diane peters Mayer will talk about her book, Overcoming School Anxiety, How to Help Your Child Deal with Separation, Tests, Homework, Bullies, Math Phobia, and Other Worries. Till then, happy parenting. Thank you.